welcome to the talk on behavior trees and blackboards in Eve Online. Uh, I'm Fred Magnusson, uh, and I've been working on Eve Online for CCB Games for the past seven years. Uh, the last year, we introduced behavior trees for the first time into Eve Online, uh, and I'm going to basically be telling you a bit of a story about how we integrated our own version of behavior trees uh, into a game that has been running for 12 years straight now. So uh, the structure is, um, we'll be introducing Eve Online and give you some context, uh, say a few words about why we needed new AI to begin with. Uh, I'm going to explain a bit about our general approach to this project and uh, explain some infrastructure changes that we made uh, to make this happen. Uh, then I'll go into the specifics of our own implementation of behavior trees and how we use them. Uh, I'll list some of the main challenges we faced during development and then go over sort of what our next steps are before Q&A. So, uh, EVE Online uh, is a game about spaceships and space conquest. It's a massively multiplayer online game. We run it on a persistent single sided server, so everybody on the same server. Uh, we have had about 300,000 users, less uh, players, I'd say, less users though, because everybody's running more than one client usually, or account. Uh, it's built around sandbox gameplay, uh, and it has a deep player-driven economy. And it offers a wide range of activities. We train trading, mining, manufacturing, piracy, warfare, just to name a few. So uh, we have over 8,000 solar systems uh, in our game, which incidentally is sort of our load balancing unit. Uh, and we have several thousand concurrent players uh, at the same time. I think our uh, PCU is 65,000, just about, connected to the server at the same time. Uh, and we have uh, massive space battles. In the, the largest one yet uh, reached over 4,000 participants. Uh, I think it was only last year. Uh, and these are actually pictures from that battle. So this is with a UI turned on. So a lot of people, a lot of ships exploding. So we released the game in 2003, uh, initially. Uh, we have had over 20 major expansions since then. Uh, and initially we published the game every six, uh, our release expansion uh, every six months. But lately we have uh, moved on to a five to six week uh, schedule. Like, so we're releasing in much smaller increments now and much faster. Since then, we have had 11 or so uh, smaller releases, and that's basically 12 years of unbroken history of player interactions. So before I move much further, I'm going to show you a theatrical trailer uh, that basically shows uh, the features I was working on uh, that was shown on FanFest uh, this year.
So that's Eve Online. <coughs> you can find this on YouTube if you want to watch it again. Uh, so uh, why did we use? I uh, want to uh, introduce new AI into Eve Online. Uh, we wanted to create new NPCs uh, that behaved in uh, ways our current system just didn't support. We wanted to make them roam uh, around the solar system, explore and engage in non-combat activities that our default NPCs just weren't capable of doing. Uh, and the current AI we had, the existing AI, was in a pretty sorry state. So bad, in fact, that uh, we really struggled to make any meaningful changes without breaking everything. So let me give you a bit more detail. So uh, the old AI was basically a state machine, which isn't so terrible in itself. Uh, but this state machine was a bit different because it didn't really define any transitions. And it didn't really define any proper states either. <coughs> so you can see sort of my predicament. So states were just like a constant shared by all kinds of different structures, NPCs, missiles, clouds, or whatever. And you were never really sure what state uh, you could be in, like what were the available states. Uh, what should happen in any of those states was pretty ambiguous. Or actually how you should get into or out of those states without breaking something. Uh, to make it worse, uh, these states were being set all over the place. So the NPC entity class themselves, of course, uh, were setting states in a, yeah, a variety of ways, which is not so surprising. Uh, but then we have NPC infestation groups. And they were also setting states, these group classes. And then we have uh, systems called GINs, which are sort of like a, a genie that spawns infestation groups. And they were also setting state. And then we have scenarios, which are basically uh, a level in Eve, a piece of content. And they were also messing with the state. So it was really hard to define any sort of ownership over the behaviors or, or just behaviors in general. So given all this, uh, we could never reliably make any change without being really afraid of of messing up everything. And that often happened if you try to make changes or even fixes. That still happens. So this uh, makes our uh, pre-existing AI very resistant to change and ultimately very risky. So <coughs> given that this has a very like, wide cone of uncertainty we, and a very high chance of fallout, we really need to, to change our strategy. So uh, our game has been around for a very long time now. Much of the code dates back to 2003. That's 12 years of legacy to deal with and growing still. So to make this feasible to begin with, uh, we formulated a general approach to, to guide our development uh, of behaviors. <coughs> so uh, the reason we started in the first place with uh, developing behaviors was to support uh, storyline developments basically with new behaviors. Uh, due to the nature of the storyline, we want to start small, uh, so we get to start on a, a single NPC. So we introduced this new type of drone called the Circadian Seekers. They would appear all over New Eden, which is the, our world, uh, and they would be furiously exploring uh, the surroundings, and they would be analyzing everything and anything that they found. It didn't have to be hostile uh, from the get-go, but uh, it would become hostile later when provoked. So this was a, a great opportunity to start uh, in a, at a very small scale. We had fairly simple requirements uh, that our current AI was incapable of uh, dealing with without major work anyway. Uh, and this gave, uh, gave us some time uh, to get the behavior tree framework into a functional state and get some basic behaviors going and, and prove that this actually worked. Uh, in addition, uh, we could limit the work needed to deploy these things because uh, the overlap with existing systems was pretty limited to start with. So uh, <coughs> this worked out great for our players because they had never uh, 
seen anything quite like this. They didn't really know what to expect of these circadian seekers. So they, they were breaking a lot of their existing assumptions, which were basically tw 10 years old at the time. So we could almost get away with murder, and they would never know if we actually intended it or not. Uh, due to our rapid uh, deployment schedule, we could keep adding and tuning bits of the behavior uh, as we revealed the mystery sort of behind the driving story. Uh, eventually, we added a much more aggressive type of uh, MPC called the drifters. And they were more complicated and uh, more aggressive than the seekers. Over a few uh, releases, we would introduce behaviors like resource harvesting, traveling through wormholes, firing a super weapon, and stuff like that. So this allowed us to uh, incrementally add sub behaviors and tune existing behaviors as we went along. Uh, we also developed most of uh, this new behavior system in parallel to our existing system. This made us uh, more nimble in, in solving our problems as we didn't have to go back and, and refactor everything uh, out of the box or refactor existing like content pipelines or, or entity classes. But I'll get into that a bit better. Um, so uh, to make this work, we had to make some changes to our infrastructure. And I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, how the changes we made. So we have this, uh, this MPC base entity class, which is the base class for all our uh, existing MPCs. And there's a Python wrapper around a C++ uh, physics object. So and this is uh, basically this, this base entity class and its descendants are as where most of the game code uh, resides. So uh, as these entity classes started to grow fat, we start to create an inherited structure to specialize and implement different capabilities, which is sort of what you expect from an object-oriented system. Uh, but at some point, this starts to grow uh, a bit out of hand, and you end with something like this. <coughs> This is now a huge web of all kinds of fun stuff. So, while the hierarchy of entities has been growing over time, uh, this inherited structure starts to show some, some serious weaknesses. So, what happens when you have two different branches of uh, the same inherited tree and they want to share some code? Well, you move it up to the, the closest shared ancestor where both can use it. So this is just the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. <clears throat> so what happens is that uh, all sorts of code starts to flow up the inheritance chain. And gradually, and gradually the base entity itself starts to bloat up with all kinds of method. It mutates into a monster superclass that does everything. <clears throat> so we ended up with something around 150 methods in this one class base entity. So the smallest change in here could affect all kinds of different entities that you had no idea even existed. <clears throat> but it's not just inheritance that is the problem here. Lazy coding over the years has basically reinforced a, a rather poor design choice from long ago. And this becomes very hard and very risky to extend in any meaningful way. But uh, we, we had a way out of this. So uh, component systems are nothing new, really. And game developers have been using them for, for years, but not in EVE, not really. So we started work around two years ago, um, where we created a component system where we had exactly the same problems. We had this, this huge hierarchy, and it was just in our way. But we had to modify this a bit uh, for our NPCs. So to make this work for our NPCs, we made some adjustments. Uh, and we needed to bypass this, this base entity class. To, uh, but we still wanted to retain some of the, the services it actually did provide. So we introduced this entity wrapper uh, that became the new base for all the old entities. And we collected just the bare minimum we needed, which is pretty much just like physics-based things, because it's just a wrapper around the physics object, really. <coughs> and uh, then we make a new subclass which we called a behavior entity. Uh, and we added some uh, event 
handling support that we needed to go forward with this. So we could make a fairly clean break from this existing structure uh, and minimize like the package we bring with us. So <clears throat> in the end, we have uh, components that define these new uh, entities rather than a base class. We no longer have uh, an object instance that represents an entity, rather a, a loosely tied collection of components that just share a single ID. <clears throat> and the old style uh, entity class is just an interface to the physics simulation rather than the game logic itself. So this is how our uh, drifted battleship behavior looks uh, in terms of components. We have a dogmatic component uh, that loads the entity into uh, our effect and attribute system, and that allows them to receive and, uh, and deliver damage, and also uh, to move around, because it defines speed and warp speed and all kinds of stuff like that. And incidentally, our, our effect system is called dogma. Uh, then we have a behavior component, and that just dictates that this should receive a behavior and has a default behavior defined. So this is what makes it load into the, the behavior system, a new system. And then we had some more components, like a, we had a turbo shield, which gives an extra layer of uh, shield. Uh, and then we had an MPC pilot component. It basically makes it look like it's piloted by a ship. So it gets an avatar and a name and some cute things. And you get kill mails as well for this. So <clears throat> onto the behavior trees themselves. Uh, our behavior trees are entirely uh, built in Python. And they run on the, the soul nodes on our uh, server cluster. And the soul nodes are basically the nodes that run the basic simulation for each solar system. Uh, they take uh, once per second, which is the same uh, update rate as the physics itself updates on. I mean, we don't really need anything more than that. Uh, <coughs> So we built them fairly granularly, the, the granular, the trees themselves, from the basic assortment of nodes. We have sequences, selectors, conditions, actions, and, and decorators, which is pretty standard. But uh, I want to talk more about the non-standard things we, we did. The first thing to note is that we uh, wanted to make our behavior tree event-driven. Uh, the primary reason why we did that was uh, scaling issues. Even is a game where we can have large group groups of players converge on a single solar system really quickly and have a huge fight that ruins everything. <clears throat> and usually they want to kill each other, but not some, some smart NPCs that are running some, like, populating some mission. So we try to avoid work when possible, and the running of events helps us uh, manage that. So when polling for state changes, we are testing the environment every update of the behavior tree. So every second, every behavior is going to ask the world about state changes. But uh, what we did instead was go for a publish and subscribe approach. So now uh, we start by having the tasks subscribe to some relevant events, and then they just immediately suspend. Uh, we still take the tree, but nothing is really happening at that point. We don't do any work at all. So uh, when we receive an event, we can then resume or terminate the task as needed. So uh, we call our three nodes tasks, and we use uh, a task queue to store all our active tasks in order of execution. Uh, we then place a marker at the end. We update the tree, and when we update the tree, we pop each task and update it. And if it remains running, we put it behind the end marker. And we keep popping and updating the tasks until we hit the end marker itself, and we're basically done. We just flip the end marker over, and we're good for another update. But what happens uh, in an event-driven case where every task suspends? We end up with an empty task queue with only the uh, end marker. The tasks have all suspended. Uh, and an appropriate event has been subscribed to, like damage received or proximity detected or something like that. And then the task just suspends. Suspended tasks are not rescheduled for execution, so they get removed from the task queue. 
so if every task suspends, there are no tasks left in the queue to update, op success. There's nothing to do. So we're effectively on hold until something actually happens, a state changes somewhere else in the system. So if an event does fire, we can complete that task, which will wake up the parent, which will schedule its next task for update. That gets put in the front of the queue, and next time we update, we initialize and update the task, and if it suspends, we're back to an empty queue. So it's a very minimal sort of set of, of things we actually have to update. But as uh, Bobby Angelov actually pointed out in a blog last year, there is a danger hidden uh, in these event-driven behavior trees. So when we're in this waiting state, you can lose all reactivity in the tree. So how do you get back to a higher priority behavior uh, <coughs> when basically all your tasks have suspended and we're not evaluating from the top every, every update? So to enable reactivity, we needed to be able to do a full reset uh, on the behavior tree. When we request the reset, uh, we flag it in the behavior tree. And the next time we update, we first check, do we need to reset? If so, uh, we basically clean up the entire tree and start from the top again. So we reschedule the route <coughs> and we start from the top. So only do that on request. So, and the cleanup mostly consists of unsubscribing to all the events we actually had subscribed to previously. And sometimes this uh, reactiveness isn't really wanted. So we implemented a special state that explicitly blocks this reset from happening. That way we can make tasks uh, and decorators uh, that are uninterruptible. So this allows us to run, uh, run long-standing tasks or entire sub-behaviors that can't be interrupted until they actually finish. So when uh, it's blocking, the reset flag is just ignored until the blocking state has been cleared, and then it will reset as normal. So, but we do have to be a bit careful here. Uh, if we're constantly resetting uh, the tree, the benefits of the event-driven suspended nature will be lost. If we reset every behavior tree update, we are forced to evaluate from the top every time, and the suspending is going to be fairly pointless. So we have to design the tree in such a way that uh, we expect these interruptions, and we can resume behaviors if we need to. So one of the great promises of behavior trees is the promise of modular behaviors. And being able to construct high-level uh, behavior modules and assemble them in uh, bigger, more complex behaviors. So in general, we want something like this. So we have a, a root, which is a priority selector, and then we just add our behavior modules in priority order. So if I get, so let's say our tree is, idling, doing nothing, nothing interesting. Uh, and we get a, a, an event, enemy spotted. Where would we want to subscribe to that event? We don't want to do it here. Because this, this would basically be coupling the, uh, the idle behavior to the combat response. <coughs> we want to put it in the combat behavior itself, like where we're actually going to respond to the event because this is only a concern of the combat behavior. If we, if we can't respond to it, then, then why subscribe to it to begin with? So and this is mostly because we are, we are avoiding uh, this top-down traversal every update. This is not so much a problem for those cases because you're, you're going the whole length every update anyway. So to solve this uh, problem, uh, we introduced the concept of monitors. A monitor uh, is a task that monitors some event or some condition. And what makes them different from other tasks is that we allow them to keep working, basically keep listening, after we actually exited the task. <coughs> so we stopped evaluating the task, but we're still monitoring some condition. So the monitor will subscribe to some event and remain subscribed until we clean up the tree with a reset. And mind you, a reset will also happen if you actually finish a tree and the tree 
succeeds or fails completely, then we will reschedule from the top and, and clean up before. Basically reset the tree. So uh, when the monitor does fire, we usually just reset the tree. Uh, or we set some blackboard value, which in turn can be monitored and cause a reset. So this way, we can embed uh, monitors uh, for conditions that we want to uh, react to within the relevant uh, behavior modules. And this is a simplified version of our compact tree and how that works. So we have these two monitors in the beginning, uh, which automatically succeed. And they are monitoring for aggressive act towards the NPC or if it detects uh, an NPC in close proximity. And then, if it actually uh, finds a target that's valid, we're going to fire another monitor, which is looking for a target lost. So if it explodes or gets removed or walks away and we lose the target, <coughs> we're, uh, it's going to reset the tree uh, and we're going to basically start over again. We're going to either pick a new behavior or find a new target. So even if we never get to picking a task and that just fails, uh, we're still going to be monitoring those first two. So if somebody aggresses the NPC, uh, that monitor is able to pull back into the combat behavior. <clears throat> or if somebody comes into the vicinity, that, that's considered threatening. So, uh, so due to this prioritization uh, of behavior, and because of uh, this greedy depth first traversal, only monitors from higher level behaviors, higher priority behaviors, are ever going to be present. So these, these orange circles might be monitors that are activated along the way while you're traversing all the way down to that idle behavior. So the further down you travel, the more events you're monitoring. But you're not actually doing any work. Usually it's some, some other system that under some condition is going to fire this event, which you would probably do anyway. So we don't have to do much work if there's not much happening. It's mostly in the, like in the combat situations where things are exploding, ships are arriving, like things are changing very fast. But that's also when you want fast reactions anyway. So uh, before I continue further, I want to talk a bit about our uh, blackboards. So we, we are using uh, blackboards for our agent knowledge. And we're also using blackboards extensively uh, to communicate between behaviors. <coughs> and I'm sure our Bohemian friends uh, are not very happy about that, but <laughs> so be it. <coughs> uh, so uh, these blackboards are not just shared memory. They also act as a, as a message broker. And this will be uh, important later on when we discuss synchronized behaviors. So uh, a blackboard is a collection of named message channels each, uh, and yeah, we have a Blackboard manager that, that then contains multiple Blackboards. A message channel is a queue of timestamped values. And then you can subscribe to a message channel. And if somebody sends an event, we will basically scatter update events. So we can subscribe to these channels and listen to them and monitor them. And that's what our monitors do uh, a lot of the time. So they're not necessarily directly Resetting a tree, they're listening for a blackboard uh, value to change. So we organize our uh, blackboards, uh, blackboards into scopes, and each entity gets uh, two separate blackboards. One uh, for a particular NPC, a, a local blackboard of sorts. And then we have a shared blackboard for the group or for the squad. Uh, we only have two scopes at the moment, but we're likely to add more in the future. So this brings us to uh, multi-agent synchronization. Uh, we need to be able to move our agents as a group. And we needed to uh, engage in uh, conflict and have them behave as a group there as well. Pick targets together and uh, focus fire and stuff like that. And the blackboards are going to help us here. So it's that second blackboard uh, for the group that provides us uh, with the tools to accomplish that. So all the NPCs. Uh, within the deployment group are going to share a blackboard between them. And by sending uh, group messages and collectively listening to changes, 
we can achieve uh, synchronized behaviors between them. So using the group Blackboard, our NPCs are, can collectively pick a place to work to, or a combat target, or whether they should pursue an enemy that's fleeing or not. So this is a, a basic exploration behavior, uh, and it makes our NPC continuously roam from system to system. So the, the first leg here uh, has a cooldown, and this cooldown is shared between the group. So it's actually <coughs> going through the blackboard. So when the cooldown uh, times out, we get a message, a value changed on the blackboard, and the others will actually detect that, since this acts as a monitor as well. So the first one to get into this branch after a timeout is going to pick a new destination. Uh, all of them are then basically going to, yeah, as I say. So they are then going to uh, monitor the new destination to see what the destination value in the blackboard. So they can monitor if the, the destination actually changes while they're in some other behavior. Uh, <coughs> and that's also set to the, to the group blackboard. And this effectively closes off the branch for the others until it expires. So yeah, so they will set up that monitor, uh, and if they're not at the current location where they want to be, they will walk to that location. And that location is actually uh, one of those, now they work to action, I say, excuse me, and the work to action uh, is an in uninterruptible action, because when you actually start a warp in E1 line, uh, you you basically disable most of your, your shape functions. You can't shoot or target or do anything. You're basically locked into that action. And we don't really want the AI to make any, any clever decisions during that time because they're all going to be wrong. So we just want to make a new decision when I actually arrive there after we unblock the, uh, the action. And when we do that, basically this, this behavior is going to complete and we reset the whole tree anyway. So, uh, final slide on the, the behavior trees themselves. So we created a, a debugger uh, to use, and this is an in-game debugger we can use from the client, and we can attach to that from the client. And it's going to update this tree, and it colors all the nodes based on uh, the return values. So the purple ones are all uh, suspended tasks. And you can see that all the composite nodes, all the, the sequences and all the uh, all the active selectors, they're all purple because they just suspend until uh, a child actually finishes. And then we have uh, the blackboards themselves. And you can see both uh, the item blackboard and the group blackboard and the values. And we can actually go and mess about with those values. We only store basic Python uh, types presently, so there's no object references to some, some complicated systems or anything like that which makes it nice because then you can just write a new value there and <coughs> send it to the server and it will update the value for the entity. Uh, <coughs> this is really nice and we can uh, add uh, multiple uh, instances of this, but uh, because it's not very optimized, if you have like more than say three, four uh, open at the same time, like the, the client is gonna get really slow, really slow. Uh, so, uh, to go over the challenges we had, the main challenges we had uh, while developing this in e online. Uh, so event handling was uh, a problem. Uh, our code base isn't really equipped or wasn't really equipped uh, to deal with fine-grained event handling. And we wanted to be able to like, listen to a specific event for a specific entity <coughs> rather than like a, a get a general broadcast and have to make a, a decision every time whether this was relevant to us or not. And that's where our, our uh, server architecture is really good. Like that, that's how, uh, but that's more of a, like a server level or cluster level RPC architecture. So we needed something more fine-grained than that. So we had to spend a lot of time to basically retrofit our code to emit these, uh, these events. And, uh, we have not been good at this traditionally. We have huge code blocks, like functions that are 400 lines for just applying damage, and you have to like, find like, where is the right spot to actually emit this event. 
So it can be a bit messy, and that's actually like it was more messy than actually creating the behaviors themselves. Uh, the other big problem we faced were, was uh, legacy systems. Initially, we were able to basically sidestep a lot of those problems um, by doing this parallel. <coughs> and while the requirements were very few, then that was pretty good. But in the end, we, we had to go back and start retrofitting uh, some of our uh, content pipeline to actually be able to deal with these behavior entities because we had broken some assumptions like triggers were stop, uh, stopped working because our groups were div different than the, the old deployment groups and such. So, uh, and that, that refactoring work actually was the source of most of our fallout in recent times. But that's more like when we started iterating more on the feature. And this is like, uh, I don't know, six, seven cycles, release cycles into the feature now. So uh, what's next for uh, behavior trees in E1Line? Well, I still haven't gotten around to do a, a proper ad authoring tool. So we're still authoring uh, behavior trees in Python code, which is not really so bad. While we have few trees and uh, not so, and it's pretty like programmer dependent still because we're developing this system and developing how how these behaviors are supposed to work and interact. But uh, we are sort of at the threshold where I really want to get those tools into place. Uh, of course, we want also more varied behaviors. That sort of goes without saying. Uh, and also want to widen the cooperation scope. We want to do more like a fleet scale action or, or faction even, <coughs> or across like a piece of, of content like the scenarios I mentioned earlier. So, and also create more specialized, more uh, interesting combat behaviors. Create snipers or logistics, and, and uh, traditionally we have been very bad at that. Like every, almost every MPC in our game is running the same code. <coughs> the same code that we can't really extend because it's gonna break everything. So, uh, I'd like to point out that there, this is heavily based on existing work. Uh, and there's not much specifically new here, but this is detailing the approach we, we uh, chose for EVE Online. And the main inspirations were uh, the many good uh, presentations from Alex Samponat uh, on uh, AIGameDev.com. Uh, I would also like to point out the, the coordinating agents uh, presentation from Ricardo uh, Piloso uh, at the Game AI conference 2009. Found that very interesting. And also uh, the blog by uh, Bobby Ankelov on synchronized behavior trees in, uh, last year. There were a lot of uh, interesting things. There are some parallels, but not, not exactly event driven. But he, he was <coughs> like, it feels like things are converging in some way if you're going this way. But uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, thank you.